You know what I what I always tell everybody, and I I told my parents it's the exact same this weekend. I said, turn it off, turn off your TV, turn off your social media. We survived for years without it. The people who are your friends and who are your neighbors, the day after the election, they're still going to be your friends and they're still going to be your neighbors. Don't feed into it. Um, you know, even myself. Come come the weekend, I turn it off. I don't I don't watch it and because uh, it's it's set up and it's established in a way t- to fuel into people's fears and their hate and their anger. And we only, we only allow ourselves to become that victim. Uh, as I've said more than once, even at, even on our worst day, we are the best country out there. And if you don't believe that travel to some of the places that, that I and so many have traveled to. Welcome back, everyone, to American Snippets. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Today, we have a former intelligence officer on the show. This frequent Fox News guest grew up on a Kentucky ranch riding rodeo before going to college and joining a fraternity. Later, he interned for a state senator who was a member of that same fraternity that he joined in college. And it was that introduction that led him into the political arena where he's ended up working for several top politicians. The decision to pursue a political path or return to his Kentucky roots uh, all disappeared on 9-11. That's when his military bloodline and his sense of patriotism called him to service. He spent years as an intelligence officer on repeated deployments before returning home and re-entering the world of politics. Today, Don Bramer is among the most influential lobbyist in the country. His company, the Bramer Group, is at the forefront of advocating for veterans, American manufacturing, and defense. Uh, He is also frequently asked to appear on national news networks and is a familiar face to those who stay up to date on current events. In this episode, Don Bramer talks about how he got started in politics, the relationships he's built, and how 9-11 changed his life's trajectory. You'll also hear about what a lobbyist really does, why it matters, and the insight gained from global travel and his continued service to our country. So without further ado, here is Barbara Allen with Don Bramer. Hey there, welcome back to another episode of American Snippets. I'm your co-host, Barb Allen. You just heard Dave Brown introduce today's amazing guest, so I'm not going to go through all of that again. Don Bramer, we are so happy and excited to have you sitting down here with us today. You know, Barb, I, uh, I've been following your show for quite some time, and I am honored and glad to be spending part of my afternoon with you and your listeners. Thank you so much. That means a lot coming from you. And happy birthday. I understand today's the Navy's birthday. It is. We are, uh, you know, and I was trying to figure out how I would reflect today's birthday. You know, uh, this past January, uh, I separated from the Navy after 18 years, and, and I'm kind of in the transition uh, phase of going into the Kentucky National Guard. So I I really find myself torn right now. And it's like, well, is it, am I being blasphemous if I celebrate the Navy's birthday or or what am I going to do the first Saturday in December when Army plays Navy? So I'm going through like having two step parents right now. (laughs) I think, and you know, I'm not obviously in the military, but I'm going to say like, I think once you serve, you always maintain the right to to celebrate. Um, I would just say, you know, a milestone you're still a part of it you're a core yes. group of it do you guys go nuts like the marines do on their birthday you know in, in a normal year yes there would be uh, navy balls uh, going on tonight all throughout the week uh at, at, at almost nearly every command uh we used to have a large one here in, in dc every year but you know uh, in the times we live right now there are no celebrations um it's just a few people who might raise their glass tonight uh, in honor of all those shipmates who served uh, before us and those who will serve after us. Yeah, I hear you. Did you see that video of the crazy prom where they had the kids back to back dancing? Did you see that? You just no, remind I, me. Of- <laughs> oh my God. 
it was like I, the creepiest I, thing. Yeah. <laughs> nothing, nothing surprises me anymore. I, you know, just reading some of the, the different CDC requirements from other countries around the world and the way that they, they look at some of these things. Um, I don't know who thinks of these things, but you know, it's interesting. I was traveling this weekend to Kentucky and you know, that Kentucky has gotten a lot of, a lot of news lately over their handling of, of COVID, but two cities, um, one Lexington, one Louisville and an hour apart, but they handled it so completely differently. And in, um, in Lexington, you see a vibrant community. It's starting to come back. Uh, a lot of activity in the restaurants and the, in the stores. And then you go to Louisville and, you know, it's still a city under siege and, and there's, it's almost like a ghost town. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's all in the mayors. It's all in the leadership, how they handle it. Uh, but it's surely closed that, you know, people are ready to come back. Um, I always stay in Louisville, but because of the way that the two mayors are handling it, I, I stayed in Lexington. Smart. Well, pray for me because I'm in New York. So. Uh, I miss New York, you know, and as yeah. we met uh, at the studios of Fox, you know, this time uh, a year ago, I was uh, spending a week a month in New York and I haven't been to the city since March. And, and I honestly miss it. But a lot of my friends are telling me that uh, I won't be going back to the same New York that I was used to. Right. Right. It's like you miss the New York that was not the New York that is now. Like, be careful. You know, what you wish for, because I'm sure you'll be back and you'll be like, what the hell happened to this? <laughs> well, I read today where um, Cuomo was being considered for uh, attorney under under a Biden administration. And and I'm like, you know, it, it just it leads to more of the insanity that we keep that we keep seeing. I mean, of, of all people and all the talent, if you were going to consider somebody um, so much controversy and, you know, just a. a a lot of bad decisions. So one more reason to, uh, to, to vote to, uh, to the president. Seriously. I can't decide if he's trying to lose or if he's just doubling down on the, on the far left, um, you know, just, just going all in. Uh, uh, (laughs) Well, you know, yesterday he said he was proud to be running for the Senate again. So uh, (laughs) so, whatever race he's in, he's all in. He's all in. (laughs) Yeah, I, I just wake up, you know, uh, you know, and if I stop halfway through our, our discussion here, I'm just going to say good morning, uh, <laughs> Sunday morning, Sunday morning. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I know. Come on, man. Um, Come on. <laughs> I know. So how do you I mean, how do you guys because you're out there, you're on all the news platforms or many of them and you're brought in as a consultant and expert and you know, you, you comment on on the political happenings and you're behind the scenes at a lot of these events, too. So what is the difference, you know, behind the scenes versus when you're on camera? Are there some times that are just so like for me, inst- watching them, I don't know how you all keep a straight face sometimes. Or I mean, is it a struggle to to just keep it serious? I mean, because it's just gotten so absurd, so crazy out there. Like, how do you keep a professional you know, on camera. as I say, and I'll use a quote, the struggle is real. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're, you're right. There's a huge difference between behind the scenes and, and what you see on set. And, and I think that's why I always tell people, you know, don't always take everything a, as gospel. And I've been on set at, at the studio and been sitting, having a conversation with a lot of, you know, colleagues who are on the other side of the spectrum and, and, you know, sit and have a conversation, go on the air, uh, go for the jugular. And as soon as the camera goes off, go have a beer. And, and I always tell everybody, it's like, remember most everything that you see on TV. Uh, a lot of it is for theater. A lot of it is production. And, and politics is the same way. Now, you know, not 100 percent, but there's there's a lot in it that is feeds what in the social media. So they go for the sound bites. They go for those snippets. And, and I think a lot of times that's where people take that and they don't read the full story or they don't look what's in context. So, you know, always remember that there's, there's more to the story. Um, and, and you're right. As I travel around, you know, I, I hear what's, you know, the polls say and what's the, the hot button topic here in DC or in New York. Uh, but then when I travel to visit clients or go out, you know, on the trail, 
there's a huge difference between what we see and what we, we read and what's going on in the rest of the country. And, and I think a lot of people forget that, that there's, um, you know, there's 47 other states out there, not just, uh, you know, California, Texas, New York, and then, you know, the, and the district of Columbia. No, there's not. <laughs> True. <laughs> My son just hit the road for it. He just landed in, uh, drove out to Wyoming, and that's where he's going to spend the next few months. And I'm a wee bit jealous of him. Um, so you're talking about your clients, and those are clients in, in the Bramer group. Correct. Correct. Yes. So, um, well, we have, we've been blessed. Um, this past August, we celebrated our seventh year uh, since I took over the helm of the firm. And you know, we have been blessed to have clients all over the world uh, supporting the defense industry and defense manufacturing here in the United States. And then, you know, over the years, that's kind of expanded into veterans issues, um, healthcare, education, and, and agriculture. But still, our, our base today, uh, we're about 85, 90 percent in the defense realm. And I think that's because coming back from Iraq myself. I always saw that there was always not the best equipment uh, available and that we could do more. And so when I came back to DCI, having understood the political process from life before the military, you know, I started putting those ideals together and, and that became the foundation for what today is, is Bramer Group. And, you know, seven years later, we're, uh, we just moved into our third new home. Uh, we've got a great team uh, here in DC and, and it's, it's been like having a child watching it grow and come to maturity. So get a little deeper into what, what your company does. I know, you know, on the website it says you assist clients and framing and presenting their issues and concerns to Congress and federal agencies to somebody just reading that, who's not in that arena, clear that up. To clear that up. I'm yeah. going to use the evil word. We're lobbyists. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it sounds an awful lot. <laughs> uh, and everyone says, "Oh my gosh, you're 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 a you're a, you're a lobbyist. You know, you're yeah. you're wagering influence to Congress." And yes, uh, that's what we do. But it's not it's not bad because what it does do is we fight for manufacturing, we fight for defense, we fight for jobs, and a lot of what we do, you know, has saved jobs. We've saved factories. Um, we've brought jobs to the United States that would have been uh, products that were, were made overseas or now here. And we help identify what states those, those jobs will go to. And, and I'll tell you, as a lobbyist, one of the, the best experiences I had was a few years ago when a, a company down in Alabama was going to be shut down because um, the government had found a, an alternate source for a particular set of, of parts and they were going to go abroad and we took it to Congress and got it reversed. And in a period of a month, we saved 87 jobs in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And a month later, I went down there to visit and I had a, a lady walk up to me with tears in her eyes and, you know, never met, met her in my life. She gave me a big hug and she said, I just want to say thank you. So to everyone who thinks lobbyists are bad, we, uh, we do, we believe in what we do. And when you've saved a job and saved a family, it's, it's certainly worth it. Do you get that a lot? I mean, that was interesting that that was your default response. Like I'm a lobbyist, but it's like, I say to people, I'm from Absolutely. New York, but don't hold that against me. You know, I mean, I, mean, so. I, I, I got it as recent as this weekend. You know, they're like, well, what do you do? And I say, I'm a GR consultant. Oh, you're a lobbyist. They're like, well, actually, yes, I am. I am a registered lobbyist. You know, and, and what I always thought about, you know, there was a time, um, in this country where the front door to the White House was open. Congress was was open and you could make an appointment, you could walk, you could go knock on the door at the White House and, and walk in and sit down. Well, obviously you can't do that anymore. There are security concerns. There's, you know, it's just a, a huge um, monster. And as it gets more complicated, you know, there's a lot to understand on how that monster operates. And the easiest thing is, we help our constituents, our, our clients, navigate the maps of both Congress and the administration. And, and a lot of times that's, that's, you know, we keep them educated. We let them, we let them do the job, but we just give them the roadmap. And, you know, one of the things that we do a little differently is a few times a year, I bring all of our clients in and we sit them down for two to three days and give them a class, you know, 
here's the difference between appropriations and authorizations. Here's who's on different committees. Here's how government works. Um, you know, as elementary as it may seem, as we start every session with the, you know, the first thing we learned on Schoolhouse Rock is my name is Bill and, and walk them through that process of, of how this works and, and actually teach them how to host a meeting uh, on the Hill so that it becomes an effective time for them. You know what, that's actually really important. I don't know, I don't have obviously experience lobbying Congress per se. I've been dealing with my own battle with the Purple Heart and my husband, they don't wanna award it to my husband and all the shit. So I've had congressional liaison, liaisons work with me and I know Gold Star Wives have been lobbying for different uh, changes in Congress and it is complex and it is, I mean, when you're someone out there, if you're entering into any system and you don't understand that system, you need a guide. It's like you wouldn't head off up a mountain into the wilderness with no experience and no equipment and no preparation. I guess some people would, right? But they probably wouldn't do very well. <laughs> so to me, it makes it makes perfect sense. And it's, it really is interesting that you're just you're just used to being attacked. I have a good friend who's a defense attorney. He was a JAG officer uh, and he gets the same thing, like a defense attorney, ah, you know, everyone, but... Right. There's a role. Every every role is vital in keeping every system going in this country. And that's what makes this country work. And you always rag on them until you need them. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny. I, I've, I've said that. Well, everybody said, you know, I was like, is that a bad thing? You know, and not until you, until you need me. Right. And not just at the federal level, but at the state level, just understanding the way government works. And the biggest part is understanding how to build coalitions. You know, and being able to look at it as an outsider and to to bring as many stakeholders as you can into the situation so that when you do storm the hill, as we say, you have an army to do it with. And, and that's a lot of times that's what it takes. Yeah. And they're big on procedure and every you have to get so many no's before you're allowed to pass through the next door to get into the next one. And you're like, all right, let's just get the no's over with. Let me just get through this gauntlet so I can get to the one that matters. Right. It's, fr it's frustrating as anything. It's and, frustrating yeah. for us, but we um, we've had, you know, we the past few years have been awesome for us. Uh, of all the amendments we've passed, uh, I think we're two years in a row for 100 percent of our amendments going all the way through to either being authorized or funded. And, uh, you know, and that's at the end of the day, when you see um, weapon systems and factories doing well, and you, you know, our service men, men and women are getting what they need, uh, jobs are coming to the country. That's a good feeling. Yeah, I bet. I bet. And do you find that you work more with one side of the aisle than the other? Or do you bounce back and forth depending on the issue? It, you're right. It, it bounces back and forth. Uh, and that's the, the good thing about us having a team. If it was just me, um, you know, I always tell you, I wear, <laughs> I wear the scarlet R. Uh, everyone knows, you know, I, I lean uh, towards one side, but you have to have relationships on both sides. And that's the beauty of our team. You know, everybody uh, that's part of the firm has their network on the Hill, their members, their staffers that, that they align with. And that's, the great thing is we all come together and we, we, we find those alliances and we build a coalition and, and we get it done. So we're, uh, as a firm, we're, we're split down the middle and, and everybody has their strengths and their weaknesses. Yeah. How does that go? And everyone gets along civilly, right? I have friends. I have a friend, she's, uh, you know, her significant other, they're on the other sides of the, <laughs> of the aisle, you know, they're living together, raising kids together. How does that go in your, in your firm, two sides uh, of the that, aisle under one roof? So we have, there are some topics that we have mutually agreed that we don't discuss until November 4th. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the overall consensus is it's, uh, even for me personally, my here, my views aren't as important as I'm here to represent a client. And we, we go at each client, giving them the, the, the best representation that they can. Excellent. And you had mentioned a little bit ago, your life before the military taught you some things. What what was that life before the military? So interesting enough, I, uh, I was raised on a ranch, uh, in Kentucky, uh, cattle, horses, never deer lick according to the improv, right? <laughs> deer lick in deer lick, Kentucky, according to the improv, I saw you do. <laughs> oh, you, you, <laughs> yeah. So my mom's, my mom's not too, my mom's not too proud of my, uh, my stand. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, yeah. I grew up with a very, very conservative, um, you know, 
Kentucky household, um, grew up, you know, grew up on a ranch and, and it taught me a lot of values and the values that I still see important today. Um, you know, came to DC, uh, right out of college, um, worked on the Hill for, uh, Senator McConnell, held several positions with him and then went back and forth to Kentucky with, with politics. 9-11 happened and, um, I resigned from everything and, and raised my right hand and, and wanted to get uh, downrange as fast as I could. And because with, of 9-11? Because, absolutely. Uh, I think 9-11 happened in 2001. On February 23rd of 2002, I was raising my right hand. Wow. How'd you pick the Navy? Uh, the Navy kind of picked me. Um you know, I was, uh, I had met with other branches that day and I was a little older than your average recruit by that time. So I didn't fall for the, the standard recruiting, uh, promises. <laughs> yeah. And, and I was frustrated and walking out and, uh, the Navy recruiter stopped me on the way out and he was like, Hey, you know, you got a minute. And he asked me what my ASVAB scores were and they were in the high nineties. And uh, he says, uh, "We let's talk for a few minutes." And he said, "You know, have you ever considered Intel?" And that was actually the area that I was interested in because the the member I had worked for was on the intelligence committee, and the the rest is history. Um, you know, I had had a great great time both active duty and reserves. Um, had some awesome mentors. I went in enlisted by choice because I wanted to get. Uh, in the thick of things as fast as I could, but, but years later ended up getting my, uh, my commission. And so I've served both enlisted and as an officer. Wow. So how did you wind up even backtracking one more step? How did you wind up coming to work for Senator McConnell at that point? Uh, so years ago, um, when Senator McConnell was the County commissioner for Jefferson County, Kentucky, um, he ran against my uncle, for uh, <laughs> county judge executive, and um, Mitch run he he won the race for for uh, county judge executive against my uncle, and then fast forward a couple years later, um, I'm in a fraternity at the University of Louisville. Um, he had just won his Senate race. Uh, he walks in. He was a member of the same fraternity, and we started talking about internships. He asked me to that I should apply. Um, I got my first internship, which led into a position. And years later, then he suggested that I go work for then Vice President Bush, and kind of all the dominoes fell into place. Wow, that's cool, isn't it? How one meeting, one moment can kind of snowball and really impact the trajectory of your really entire is. life. And you know, even nine eleven in itself. Yeah. I I hold 9-11 completely responsible for the place that I am in today. Um, so do I. <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I would have probably I would probably be back home uh, either working for my dad's company or, or back home on, on a on the ranch um, had it not happened because I went into the military, I became part of the intelligence, I got to understand how politics and the defense industry work. I went to work for a firm and then I took over the firm and here we are today. Uh, so, you know, if you'd asked me 20, 30 years ago, was, would I be, you know, a commentator uh, on Fox or be leading one of the top lobbying firms uh, in DC? I would have laughed at you, but here we are. But here, here we are. The joke would have been on you, I guess. It would have been. It would have been. <laughs> So I still love going home. It was it's it's really funny. Is as, as, as soon as I get back in the state, you know, I find myself within minutes. Uh, my accent changes really quick. Um, you know, life it, life here and life there are completely different. It's just a completely different pace, and, and it's good. It reminds me of, of where I came from. Reminds me of, of why I do what I do, and, and I love getting out. And just being around people and getting outside of this bubble that uh, that I get trapped in sometimes. Yeah, that's probably a really um, powerful thing to have that release to be able to step away. I mean, I'm guessing there are people that stay in D.C. in that environment 
24 seven, not Congress really, but 24 seven, you know, seven days a week and, and, uh, and put in just like never step back and never take that breath. Yeah. And you, uh, all you need to do is, you know, log into some social media and you get reminded of that really quick. It's like, man, take a breath, you know, just, uh, life is not that bad. Um, yeah. you know, and you know, everything is not personal. I think a lot of people, they get so wrapped up in it that, you know, they take everything personal and it's at the end of the day, you know, we're all going to disagree, but we also live in the greatest country in the world. And, and we, we have so much to be thankful for. Yeah. And that's another um, little segue into a conversation I wanted to get into with you. You've been to a lot of, a lot of different countries in, in the course of your service in the course of your life in general. Um, I know, I mean, it's easy to look at a lot of countries and say, when you compare and contrast some countries to this country and, you know, the advantages, disadvantages, it's easy to look at some and write, you know, see the, the atrocious things happening, the genocide, the war, the communism and all that. But outside of those things, um, what are some key differences you see between the countries, things that say, things that are better in this country or things that could be improved upon based on other countries you've been to? I mean, there's, there's always room for improvement, but having traveled to visit our allies, you know, having been to third world countries, um, the one thing that I, that I have taken away, and especially this is from uh, my time in Israel, because there, you know, there are countries surrounded by constant war, constant conflict. And one thing that struck me interesting about Israel is you would think that they would have a much higher level of PTSD uh, because of that, that constant battle that, that we have. Uh, but they actually have a very low um, per capita rate of PTSD. And part of that I, that I learned is uh, two things. They embed a mental health professional in each unit that's military, which I think is an awesome ideal. That's uh, amazing. Yeah. It, um, they, they see signs of issues before it ever, you know, takes root. And I think that was, that was an incredible uh, experience with my time with the IDF is how they embed those mental health professionals. But, but the other thing is something I think we could learn here is the sense of family, the nucleus of the family. Um, it is, you know, still such a huge part of the Israeli culture and in a, in a lot of other cultures that I, that's the one thing I wish that we as Americans could get back to um, taking care of your own and realizing that we're not all perfect, but we are still family. We are still blood and, and understanding that you just don't toss somebody away because they don't fit the mold. Um, and I, I think that, you know, it, what, what I really enjoyed about Israel is, is my friends there is, you know, family meals are still such a huge part of their, their daily ritual. And, um, it seems like such a small thing, but just to sit around and hear them talk about their day and, and share their experiences and their faith, um, you can see it goes a long way. Yeah, that's, I didn't know that, you know, that big, uh, and certainly here, I think it used to, I remember growing up, we used to do that more, but now even as I became a mom and had kids, and I mean, things were a little different in my my world, but that being said, with schedules and kids' sports and everybody running in a hundred different directions, this one working, it is. Uh, and most of the people I know don't really sit down and have that evening meal together because everyone's so busy. You know, we're just busy going here and busy going there. All right, so you founded a really cool uh, organization. I'm going to I'm going to stop oh, you there real quick on that. But I do think that one of the positive thing that's going to come out of COVID is people have been forced to be a family again. You know, we can't go out to restaurants. We have to order in. And I think the one good thing that will come out of this is, yes, it hurts a lot of the restaurant industry, but people are learning how to cook again and people are learning how to communicate as a family because they have no other choice. So in a lot of ways, I always think look for the silver lining. I think just what you were saying, I think we're going to come out of this and I'll, families will either be farther apart or they'll be closer together. That is actually a really good point. I saw that with my own kids. My oldest son, he's 21. Uh, he had a job set up in Alaska. He was supposed to be on a glacier taking care of dogs and all this stuff. And that was canceled. My other kids went back to college. So it was my oldest and my youngest. And they've never had time, just the two of them, to yeah. spend together before. And so when my oldest just left, 
it was like my youngest had just lost his new best friend. You know, they got to spend time together that they, not that they weren't close, but you know, like they, they just created this well, relationship curious, that wasn't there. And I, I've heard that from other families as well, you know, different things. Um, it's great being in the same house with my fiance all the time, working together, living together, <laughs> never <laughs> going anywhere. <laughs> He's ignoring me now. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I see it, it does go one of both ways. And that was an excellent point. All right. Um, so American Freedom of Fun, before I forget, because that's how I first really n like knew who you were. You know, I think anybody um, who sees you is like, oh, I, I know him. Like you're a very recognizable face um, and, and figure. But for me, it was the American Freedom Fund where I first was like, oh, that's what he does, you know. Right. And um, so, you know, that's what drew me to to who you are and what you do first for whatever reason. So do you want to talk about that? And I know you're, you're no longer at the helm, which is, I really want to get into that as well. Um, but talk about the American freedom fund, what it is, why you founded it. So, uh, you know, it, it, it kind of all goes back to, to three things. When we started the firm, uh, you know, we, uh, at that time as a small group, we were a hundred percent all veterans. We had all served together and uh, I wanted to give back. And so the, our, the very first uh, Bramer Group Christmas party, uh, the decision was made that we ask everybody to contribute to three select uh, VSOs. And that, that's kind of how, how it be, that was the birth. Um, and then one of the things that we would do is we would pick uh, two to three VSOs a year as a firm that we would mentor or uh, support pro bono. And, and so that was the foundation. And through that, I would learn of these different programs or, or small VSOs that were struggling. And they, they always say, be careful what you wish for. Um, because the years later has progressed. I was advising these programs, advising these groups. And next thing I know, they're coming together and we've, we've aligned them and combined them into one organization that myself and two other service members started. And so I, in a lot of ways, while AFF itself is only four years old, each of our programs is much older and they come from, from either different organizations or they were VSOs uh, that had failed and we brought them back to life. So each program's a little different. And here we are, um, you know, I guess the organization now that goes into its fourth year and Manhattan's Martinis and Mistletoe, which is kind of our birthplace, is now uh, one of the largest veterans galas here in D.C. each December. Very bipartisan. We drive uh, four to five hundred people. We award our, our veterans awards each year and we bring people from all over the country to, together. And, and it's sad because uh, in seven years, this will be the first year that we don't have it. And uh, we were really excited about it a brand new format, but uh, next year we'll be back. You can't do it on a smaller scale or is it, you know, it's so it, crazy what's happening it, with the events. Yeah, right? it's, it's you know, we, we looked at it and because so many of our guests uh, travel so far and a lot of our, you know, a lot of the veterans that do come are what, what you would call, you know, but vulnerable. Right. That it's, it's not fair to them and to move forward with it would put the the foundation at incurring a large debt and it's just not fair to the organization and, and to what we built to, to put that kind of burden on them. Yeah, I hear you. All right. So what is the primary goal there is to raise funds and to support the veteran service organizations? So the the original purpose was to, to raise funds for other VSOs. Um, as those programs came under us, then we've, we've created our tenants, which is uh, athletics, education, and, and, and advocacy. Um, we still do some pr pro bono work on the Hill for other VSOs, and that's where the advocacy part comes in. Uh, we have scholarships that we work with veterans who want to go into politics or policy where we'll get them a uh, semester on the Hill. But, but our key thing is, you know, athletics and community. And, you know, uh, I've, I've always had the, the belief that when you when you're transitioning out of the military, um, one of the most important things that you you lose is that tribe, that family, and for a lot of people, that's you know that's the only family they know, and that's the only community they know. And when you rip that away from them through uh, transitioning, uh, through coming off deployment, it creates a void. And veterans are the world's worst. Uh, we have a tendency 
when things aren't well, we go home, we lock the doors and we, we barricade ourselves. And, and so I, we, we have the slogan, get off the couch because that's where things go wrong. And, and we found that through softball, through golf, uh, outdoor, we have a, a shooting team, a climbing group, a, a whitewater kayak group, any kind of activity that gets people together that even when they're not in the forest or in the field, they have a network in their phone that they always have somebody to reach out to when they're having a bad day. So, so our goal is just, you know, uh, to create opportunities for people to come together, build a network and be there for each other. And, you know, pre COVID we were running effectively in about 16 States, uh, with some type of, of program and it continued to grow. Um, we've done a really good job of maintaining those relationships, even as tough as it's been. And, um, next year is going to come back strong. And I, I think that, uh, We've got a great, a great group of folks. Um, I did uh, build in a term limit for myself when I founded the organization because I'd seen a lot of VSOs get stagnant and get stale under the same leadership, and I didn't want that to happen. So I, I, I put an expiration date on myself that uh, I would step down, and our uh, Gabe Stecker, who was – uh, one of our directors uh, stepped up in March as our new executive director. And, um, but they didn't let me go far. Uh, when they had the elections for the board of governors, uh, I was elected as chairman. So I didn't get to escape. I just got a new job. You need to have uh, two escape hatches next time. <laughs> lesson, <laughs> lesson, lesson learned. Uh, but that is as uh, I had, you'd been able to tell me about that before. And it is one of the coolest things I think, cause I, I do. I am familiar with a lot of VSOs, and I am not familiar with one who has that built in. How does an existing VSO um, get itself under your wing, or do they, or are, do you only have non? We've had a, we've had a few. They're not not as much VSOs, but programs that um, were part of another VSO, but um, you know they weren't getting the the love or the attention that they thought that they they deserve. And they would, they would come to us and we had them just call and be like, uh, I mean, I'll use an example, um, you know, softball teams that are part of other softball or, or athletic organizations. Like, and we're just not getting the support that we want. You know, can we join you? And we, we set up a, a framework where I don't want to say it's a franchise, but very similar is like how you can function under us and allow us and our size to to give you benefit and put you under the umbrella where we can help you through this, the structure that we created. Yeah, that's cool. Um, Cause I know that there are, are a lot of organizations out there and I love that you created a central space for at least a core group of them, because oftentimes things get lost in the, in the noise and bouncing around and it can be overwhelming. You know? it, it is overwhelming. And, you know, um, people's lives change and, you know, a lot of, organizations get started because it's a great idea and they, they do a good thing, but uh, it takes a lot to stay on top of. And if you, yeah. you don't understand all the mechanics that goes behind it, um, you know, it's really hard to, you know, to stay on top of, you know, Hey, are your, you know, are your filings current? Are you, how are you keeping your board informed? Um, a lot of people are really good at, at doing the, the act. They just don't do the, the follow-up and the paperwork. And that's, you know, having that infrastructure helps. Um, yeah. Because you have to have those things in order to maintain a strong donor base and, and to be eligible for grants. And and keeping up with all those, those you know, matrices of how many successes you have, those are the things that make you eligible for grants. And that's how you continue to grow. Yeah. And a lot of times, like you said, you start those organizations, people tend to have bigger hearts than a sense of business. I, I definitely fall into that category. I, all that paperwork. No, thank you. Like, you know, I'll do grunt work all day, but and, and take some from me at the desk. Yeah. Gabe is, Gabe is really good with, you know, the, the mission and the heart. Um, I tend to be the stickler for the admin side and, you know, for, for helping to raise money and for grants. Um, so, so we, it was a good balance there, you know, the, the original, all three original directors are still involved. Um, as much as I try to escape, uh, they won't let me yet, but I, you know, as I tell them, you know, I, I have a few other things still yet to accomplish and, uh, and I have, I've given myself a time limit that I need to go, uh, prepare for those for 
my next chapters. Yeah. What are those next chapters? We can't disclose those you yet. Can't. But, uh, I had to ask. <laughs> you, well, I figured you would, but uh, you know, we're about we're about uh, we're about a year away from making those announcements. But uh, yeah, I'm re- we got some exciting things that that are going to happen. Uh, a lot of people keep telling me I need to do this, and uh, so uh, we're going to make the decision very soon. Okay. Well, if you need any help in your campaign, you just call me. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> And I'll be happy to support you in any way I can. Well, we All appreciate right. it very much. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of, um, you also are involved with an, or, an organization, Entity Defend Our Nation. Mm-hmm. Um, do you want to talk about that for sure. a minute? Well, Perfect Defend segue. Our Nation, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Defend Our Nation was the, the third of the three tenants of, of BG. And if you look at our logo, uh, there's three stars. And that the reason of that, uh, is each of those stars represents a different uh, part of the group and Framer Group, uh, American Freedom Fund, and Defend Our Nation. Uh, Defend Our Nation is a political action committee that um, raises funds for veterans who want to run for office or who are in office. Um, there's an organization called Veterans Campaign that I have been an advisory member of for several years. And that's kind of how I got interested in doing this is it's a, um, a course or a frame of courses that teaches veterans how to run for office, completely bipartisan. They have a Republican uh, program, they have a Democrat program, and it's, it's a field manual for how to turn your service into a second service, whether it's as a candidate or a chief of staff or, or whatever aspect of a campaign that, that you can do. And, but the key part, as everyone knows, in running a campaign these days is it's very expensive. And so we would help raise money and then based on evaluations, uh, help disseminate those funds to either those challengers or those incumbents. So same question as with um, American Freedom Fund, how does a veteran who is looking to run for office or in office, what's the threshold they have to meet in order to be eligible for support? So there, um, defendournation.org is the website and you can go in there and reach contact us. Uh, there's a questionnaire that was created by our board. Uh, our board is 50, 50, um, half Democrat, half Republican. Um, actually, ironically, the, uh, the, the Democrat members are the one who wrote the questionnaire, but it's really not that partisan because it goes to the core values, which is national security, foreign policy, and veterans affairs. Um, all those other social issues that are out there, we, we, get a, we avoid, we stay away from, we don't want to touch. Uh, we stick to our tenants and because that's what's important to our organization. So they fill out a, a questionnaire, uh, they go before the board, they're vetted, and then depending on the race, um, they're either in, we do endorsements and or get, uh, present uh, support through, uh, through monetary ways. Um, you know, it's the only thing that we kind of have a criteria is you got you to gotta be voted on by the board. You got to answer the questionnaire and we won't endorse a race where there's two veterans running against each other. Oh, yeah, I didn't even think about that. That's quite so, the pickle. <laughs> you know, there's some great people out yeah. there, but um, we always tell them come back after the primary because, you know, yeah. we would never want to pit uh, two of our service members against each other. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Unless, of course, it was like Navy guy you could champion, right? Or Navy. Navy <laughs> just, no, I, I, honestly, I can't just, because I I'm know. Really on, on the board of the, the, the pack, I'm the only Navy guy on there, so I would get voted out. Uh Oh, voted off your own island. All right. Look, as we were talking about before, there is no denying that this country is in unprecedented, crazy times. Right. And there's a there is a lot of negativity out there. And you see the whole or much bigger picture than we do because you're in it and you're in the thick of it. But for people like me and uh, and most of our audience, we get the majority of what we know um, from social media, from the news, from all that. And the majority of what we're hearing is that we're screwed, is that no matter what happens, we're screwed. Whatever candidate wins, this is the message being sent out, right? 
Um, I'm, I, we don't buy into it. That's why we're doing what we do here. But talk to those people. There are a lot of people who are buying into that message a lot. And we're getting, I know this because we get an onslaught of it. We get messages, we get hate, we get all sorts of people telling us why we're so wrong to defend our country, to love our country. To, so what would your message be to those people who are buying into that message that America is doomed one way or another, that there's no good candidate to win, that nothing good can happen? You know what I what I always tell everybody, and I I told my parents it's the exact same this weekend. I said, turn it off, turn off your TV, turn off your social media. We survived for years without it. The people who are your friends and who are your neighbors, the day after the election, they're still going to be your friends and they're still going to be your neighbors. Don't feed into it. Um, you know, even myself. Come come the weekend, I turn it off. I don't I don't watch it and. Uh, cause it's, it's set up and it's established in a way t- to fuel into people's fears and their hate and their anger. And we only, we only allow ourselves to become that victim. Uh, as I've said more than once, even at, even on our worst day, we are the best country out there. And if you don't believe that travel to some of the places that, that I and so many have traveled to, um, you know, if socialism were so great, then, you know, why are the people in Venezuela eating out of trash cans? You know, um, you know, even during COVID, when we were in, in the scariest of times, our, our, we had food, we, we had running water, we had electricity. And people forget that, you know, we have so much to be thankful here. And you just gotta, you just gotta turn it off and walk away. Um, don't allow yourself to be the victim and don't allow people to tell you what to think. The resources are out there, no matter what side you align with, do your homework, do your research and learn how to, to have critical thinking skills yourself. That's God gave us a brain, learn how to use it. Um, don't, don't let every people, other people rule your life because that's what'll happen. Yes. Well said, well said. And we started American snippets a few years ago because even then three years ago, the divisiveness in this country really coincidentally about the same time the election, you know, um, really took root or even before then, but three years ago, it was really hitting hard. And for me personally, as a widow of a service member, our family had given so much to this country. And I saw everybody just complaining about this country and saying how terrible it was. And I was struggling with that, thinking of all the people who gave so much for this country, felt like people were just pissing on it. Right. So, but I also knew that most of the people in this country are good, that there's a lot of amazing things that happen in this country. The true heartbeat of Americans is extraordinary. And I know the people would step forward to serve me and help me and my family to come forward to help others. And that's why we wanted to bring those stories out to the country, you know, on the platform and remind people about what's so great. But a a core tenant of that is that we also defend the concept of the American dream. We believe the American dream is in fact alive and well, even, or I would even argue, especially now, when uh, new paths are emerging for it. But we know that the American dream looks different to everyone, that we all have our own version of that. So we'd like to ask you, Don Bramer, as an American citizen, a military veteran, and now doing all the extraordinary things you do and see, what is your version of the American dream? I think my American dream is every day that I wake up, you know, as I said earlier in our conversation, I never in all my life imagined that I'd be sitting where I am today. my, I, I kept notes and journals when I, I used to ride rodeo and I grew up on a ranch and I, I come across a lot of those old writings and I had a much different path picked out for myself. And it just goes to show that as I tell everybody, you know, a dumb farm kid from Kentucky can do a lot of good things. And, you know, I remember the, one of the first times I was walking on the set, you know, in New York at Fox and, you know, my inner voice was like, it was like, dude, what are you doing here? And, and that's exactly what the American dream is. Um, no matter where you come from, no matter who you are, um, if you, if you're willing to work for it and you don't expect somebody to do it for you, you can achieve almost anything. And I mean, I grew up in a very modest upbringing and in, in, a, in a million years, what I imagine that I'd be a, where I'm at and I would travel the world but we're, we're so blessed and, you know, without, without even getting into people's faith, we just, we're fortunate and we need to realize that, you know, dreams come true. And if that wasn't the case, 
there wouldn't be so many people knocking down fences and breaking down walls to get in here. I love it. You rodeoed? I did. I <laughs> was a bull rider and a saddle bronc rider for much of my uh, late teens and early 20s. I love that. You know, not too long ago, I was pretty fire on a mechanical bull, um, <laughs> a reigning champion in my area, if you will. So, so maybe one day we can have a ride off. I'll, I'll let you beat me. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm not as uh, as graceful as I used to be. Perfect. Uh, so Even you, more. You, you know, <laughs> they'll, probably, they'll probably knock me off really quick. <laughs> All right. Look, Don, we really, really appreciate a, your service, and I say that with utmost sincerity. We didn't even get a chance to get into all of that um, area, which I would have loved to. Um, but really, from from all of us, thank you for that service. Um, and thank you for everything you're doing today and for taking the time to sit down and share your story and your time with us in our community. You know, it, it was it was an honor and a privilege. Uh, anytime you want to have me back, you just you re, all you have to do is ask. Uh, thank you guys for what you do. Uh, for showing the good side of our country and reminding people that uh, they should be thankful every morning when they wake up. Awesome. I'll take you up on that. And if people want to connect with you, follow up and learn about what you're doing, support your organizations, remind us all where, where they can go to find out the information on that. The easiest place to find me is on Twitter at Donald R. Bramer. Uh, if you want to learn about the organization, AmericanFreedomFund.org, or if you want to learn more about the firm, uh, BramerGroup.com. I'm so sorry. That is my my phone beeping in because my son is FaceTiming me. <laughs> hey, family's important. You go, uh, you go take I care of I thought I house. had that turned off. <laughs> and uh, good luck to him in Wyoming. And, uh, and you guys, you know, enjoy all the family time you can. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Rookie error, man. Oh, I'm the death glare I'm getting from Dave over there. But look, it happens. <laughs> Don, really, thank you so very much. And you have an excellent day. Awesome. Hope to see you soon, Barb. Yeah, you too. Thank you.